This is a video for MCDB 427, which is molecular biology at the University of Michigan. In this video, we will be presenting evidence that the U1 small nuclear RNA binds directly to the 5' splice site in pre-mRNA as a significant part of the RNA splicing process, according to a 1986 experiment by Zhuang and Weiner. Figures 1411, 1412, and 1413 can be found in the fifth edition of molecular biology. So what is RNA splicing exactly? In eukaryotes, when RNA polymerase transcribes a strand of messenger RNA from a DNA template, this messenger RNA is not yet ready to be translated. Within this mRNA, known at this point as pre-mRNA, there are non-protein coding regions known as introns that must be taken out so that only the exons, which contain the 5' and 3' untranslated regions, as well as protein coding regions, are left. The process of removing introns and linking together the ends of exons where the introns once were is known as RNA splicing. Splicing is mediated by small nuclear RNAs, which associate with protein factors to form a complex called small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, more commonly known as SNRPs. Here are models of the U1 snRNA on the left and the full U1 SNRP on the right. The RNA component of SNRPs as we will see more evidence for soon, is very important because some snRNAs have the ability to base pair to specific sequences in the pre-mRNA or to each other. When SNRPs come together using RNA-RNA and RNA-protein interactions, they form a larger complex called the spliceosome that is able to catalyze the removal of introns and the linking of exons. The mechanism for this is shown here, with the five SNRPs that are involved called U1, U2, U4, U5, and U6. These SNRPs bind to the pre-mRNA and to each other in a multi-step process, but here's just a really short overview of what some of the SNRPs are doing. First, the U1 SNRP base pairs to the 5' splice site, while U2, with its auxiliary factor, base pairs to the branch point. Subsequent binding of U5, U4, and U6 allow for the intron to be converted into a lariat or loop-shaped intermediate that can be excised. U1 and U4 are then displaced, and the remaining SNRPs continue the splicing. So, how does the spliceosome recognize what needs to be removed and what needs to be ligated together? The structure of an intron, as it appears on the DNA coding strand, is composed of a 5' splice site, or splice donor, as shown here on the left, and a downstream 3' splice site, or splice acceptor, as shown here on the right. The 5' splice site includes an invariant GT sequence at the end within a larger, less highly conserved region. Downstream, we have an invariant adenine at the branch site, also within a less highly conserved region. Finally, we have the 3' splice site, which includes an invariant AG sequence at the end, as well as a sequence of high pyrimidine content slightly upstream. Using these conserved bases, the spliceosome is able to identify regions in the pre-mRNA that need to be spliced together. The authors of this study provide several pieces of evidence that led them to believe that the spliceosome recognizes splice sites within pre-mRNA through complementary base pairing. Before this study, Potential regions of complementarity were observed between the 5' splice site and the 5' end of U1 snRNA in rats. This led researchers to propose a mechanism in which the spliceosome recognizes pre-mRNA through complementary base pairing of U1 with the 5' splice site. Many other pieces of evidence were provided to support this proposed mechanism. Ultimately, the authors argue that all of these findings, while very strong, are indirect evidence of the interaction between the 5' splice site and U1. In order to find direct evidence of this mechanism, the authors tested how mutations in 5' splice sites and in U1 impacted RNA splicing. Essentially, the researchers wanted to answer two questions. One, is complementary base pairing between the 5' end of U1 snRNA in the spliceosome and the 5' splice site of pre-mRNA necessary for RNA splicing? And two, 
Is base pairing between these two elements sufficient for splicing to occur? Some genes contain multiple splice sites, which allows pre-mRNAs to be alternatively spliced. Figure 11a displays the pre-mRNA product of a viral gene called E1a, with the colored blocks indicating exons in the transcript and the thin line in the middle indicating an intron in the transcript. While we just discussed that all introns are flanked by 5' and 3' splice sites, there are also two more 5' splice sites in the E1A transcript that are located within exons. Because there are three possible 5' splice sites for a single 3' splice site, there are three mature mRNA products of different sizes that can be produced when the spliceosome ligates them together. These mRNA products are named according to their sedimentation rate in a centrifuge, with 13S representing the largest product and 9S representing the smallest product. In order to observe the relative concentrations of each of these three splice products under experimental conditions, these scientists use a technique called RNase protection assay. For an in-depth explanation of how this type of assay is performed, I'll link a video down below. But the general process is that these scientists constructed a uniformly radio-labeled RNA probe that could hybridize to any of the splice products. Here we can see the hybridized probes as purple lines. Notice that there's no hybridization in areas where an intron was spliced out. The next step is to add RNase, represented here by the black X's on the probe. When RNase is added, any single-stranded RNA, in this case, any length of probe that was not hybridized, is degraded, leaving behind labeled double-stranded RNA that can be denatured and run on a gel. The gel separates the single-stranded RNAs based on size, so after this assay was performed, we would expect to see bands of three different sizes corresponding to the three possible splice products. In figure 1411b, we can see a depiction of the expected alternative splice products of E1A, as well as a radio-labeled probe used for the RNAs protection assay. As previously discussed, each alternative splice product is a different size, so following hybridization with the probe and degradation with RNAs, we expect to see radioactive fragments of 611 nucleotides, 473 nucleotides, and 136 nucleotides long on a gel, and a common product from the 3' exon that is produced from any of these splicing events. From the results of the RNAs protection assay, we can see that these predictions were pretty accurate. In lane 1, we have our molecular weight markers, which give us a size standard to compare to. Lane 2 shows the results of mock transfected cells, which used an empty vector as a control, showing us that the probe doesn't hybridize with any endogenous RNA from the cell line that was used. Lane 3 shows the results of a cell line transfected with the wild-type E1A gene. As predicted, we see bands at around 611 nucleotides and 473 nucleotides corresponding to the probe mRNA for the 13S and 12S splice products, respectively. No probe hybridized to the 9S splice product, which the authors note as being a result of 9S splicing occurring later in infection than the point that was tested. At the bottom of the gel, we observe a band representing the probe hybridizing to the 3' exon, which is the common product we mentioned before. At this point, the authors wanted to know how these results would change if complementarity was perturbed between the 5' splice sites of 12S and 13S and U1 snRNA. In order to do this, they developed different cell lines containing mutations at these sites. The first mutant cell line was co-transfected with the HR440 double mutation, which changed a GG sequence to AU in the 12S 5' splice site of E1A. It is worth noting that although the total number of base pairs between the mutant mRNA and wild type U1 were predicted to be the same, the number of contiguous or uninterrupted base pairs would be disrupted. 
Lane 4 contains the results from this 12S double mutation in E1A paired with wild type U1. We observe that there is no longer a band for the 12S splice product. Additionally, we can see that the band for the 9S splice product appears and that there's more splice product for the 13S site. These results suggest that the base pairing between U1 and the pre-mRNA was impaired, leading to the inability to splice at this location. From this, we can conclude that base pairing at this location is necessary for splicing to occur. The second mutant cell line was co-transfected with a mutation of both the 12S double mutation and a new mutation called U14U which introduced a new mutation in U1 that restored contiguous base pairing with the mutant 12S splice site we saw previously. Lane 5 shows our results. Mutant U1 was predicted to have more complementarity with the 12S double mutation than wild type U1, and we see that the results strongly resemble the wild type trial. This would suggest that base pairing at this location is sufficient for splicing to occur. So, what can we conclude here? If we make a mutation in the pre-mRNA that cannot base pair with U1, we wipe out splicing at this location. If we make a compensatory change in U1 to restore base pairing, we can suppress this phenotype and splicing is restored. Thus, for this splice site, base pairing between the 5' splice site and U1 is sufficient for splicing to occur. The third mutant cell line contained the PM1114 mutation, which changed an A to a U in the 13S splice site. Similar to what we observed with mutating the 12S splice site, this mutation was predicted to disrupt contiguous base pairing with U1. In lane 6, we observed that the 13S single mutation had a similar effect to 12S double mutation in that it eliminated the 13S splice product. Once again, we can see that the concentration of the other splice products seems to increase. This supports our previous conclusion that base pairing is necessary for splicing in this location to occur. The last mutant cell line was co-transfected with both the 13S single mutation and a mutation called U16A, which introduced a new mutation in U1 that was predicted to restore contiguous base pairing with the mutant 13S splice site. Lane 7 shows the results. While we would predict from what we saw previously that the 13S splice product would be restored, this was not the case. So, what can we conclude from this? If we make a mutation in the pre-mRNA that cannot base pair with U1, we wipe out splicing at this location. If we make a compensatory change in U1 to restore base pairing, however, we do not suppress the phenotype and do not restore splicing. Thus, for this splice site, base pairing between the 5' splice site and U1 is not sufficient for splicing to occur. It was found after the 1986 experiment that the reason that the 13S single mutation and the U1 mutant did not restore the 13S splice product was because the mutation in the 13S single mutation eliminated complementarity with U6, another important SNRP in the splicing process. So what can we take away from all this? The initial purpose of the study was to find direct evidence for the proposed mechanism that the 5' end of U1 snRNA recognizes the 5' splice site in pre-mRNAs. We observed that while restoring base pairing between U1 and the 12S splice site following mutation allowed for splicing to occur, this did not occur when the same methods were applied to the 13S splice site. Thus, we can conclude that base pairing between U1 and pre-mRNA occurs but restoring base pairing to the 13S splice site mutant is not sufficient for splicing to occur. Later experiments show us that binding between U6 and the pre-mRNA was perturbed, which is what impaired 13S splicing. Thank you guys so much for watching our video. Good luck studying and go blue!